Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on cyclic AMP signaling. And in this video, what we're going to talk about is uh, sperm motility, so how to sperm move, and what, uh, in particular, what signaling pathways are controlling how fast sperm move. Okay, and what we're going to find out is that actually cyclic AMP controls sperm motility, and also um, it's calcium as well. So calcium um, is oscillating within sperm is what we're going to see. And basically that triggers a, a, a phasic oscillation of cyclic AMP that is coupled to the um, rises in calcium basically. And the rises in cyclic AMP then cause motility of the sperm. And what we're going to see is that actually um, it's um, it's not uh, that the um, oscillations in calcium are really really important for this. So the layout for this video is firstly we're just going to have a little bit of a revision of what a sperm actually looks like. So sperm structure. Then what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, how um, calcium is oscillating within um, within the uh, cytoplasm of spermatozoa. And then what we're going to talk about is how that actually causes the sperm to move. Right, okay, so uh, sperm structure then. Right, so most people are familiar with this sort of tadpole structure. You have a head, then what you have is uh, something known as a collar of the sperm. And then it narrows again down from there and you have the tail then, or the flagellum is the sort of scientific name for the tail of the sperm. So here is our tail. Okay, so that's uh, the structure of our spermatozoa. So here we have the flagellum, or the tail. Okay, and uh, this portion uh, in the middle, called the collar, which is sort of an intermediate thickness between the head and the tail, this is absolutely stuffed full of mitochondria. So there are loads of mitochondria in here. So I'll draw a mitochondria in here. And this is because you're going to require energy to uh, beat the tail. So you've got the mitochondria nice and close to where the energy is actually going to be used, which is in the tail. So the collar is full of mitochondria. Okay, right. So here is a mitochondria. Uh, a mitochondrion, maybe, I should, uh, I'll just leave it like that. Okay, so then in the head, you have a huge weight structure, which is the nucleus of the sperm. So here's the nucleus. Um, I'll just draw those to show that that's the nucleus. So that entire great lump there is the nucleus. And then um, in front of the nucleus, what you then have is the acrosome. So you have a pouch containing enzymes, basically. And uh, this is one of the ways in which the sperm uh, break, do, break through uh, the um, cell there that surrounds the, um, the egg cell, the cumulus oophorus. Um, so basically, uh, when, when the um, egg cell is released into the fallopian tube, it's not released on its own. It ends up with a whole bunch of cells around it. And those bunch of, that bunch of cells around it is known as cumulus oophorus. And the acrosome helps the sperm break through those cells. So it, uh, is re it basically breaks down and re releases a huge amount of enzymes onto those uh, cumulus oophorus cells and breaks them down to allow the sperm to move through. Okay, right, so that's the basic structure of a sperm. Now let's discuss what calcium is doing within the sperm. So basically, if we have a graph here, and along the x-axis we have time, and along the y-axis we have intracellular calcium concentration within the spermatozoan, um, so I'll put calcium concentration I for intracellular, then what we see is that calcium concentration does something like this. It goes up, and then it goes down. It goes up, and it goes down. It goes up, and it goes down. So you get oscillations in calcium level. And basically, what you find is that when calcium goes up, that produces motility of the tail. And um, so you get bursts of activity of the tail when calcium goes up, and then, um, uh, it slows down for a bit, and then another burst of activity, and then another burst of activity. And you might wonder, well, what's the point of this? Why don't we just have calcium level continuously high, and then have the tail going continuously? 
Well, basically what you find is that if you, if you do that, if you have calcium continuously high in the cytoplasm of the sperm cell, it doesn't move at all. So continually high calcium levels, say we did, uh, did something like this, low, really high calcium levels, if we had this, the sperm doesn't move at all. Um, so no movement of the sperm. So you need the oscillations in calcium, basically, in order to in order to um, in order to have the motility of the tail. So no movement. And basically, what we can do to further explore this is we can look at how this is coupled to cyclic AMP going up and down. So basically, in spermatozoa, you have the um, adenylylcyclase enzyme, adenylylcyclase eight. And adenylylcyclase 8, as we know, is activated by calcium, and we will go over the mechanism by which it's activated by calcium again, because that's actually going to be really important. So if we actually plot what the cyclic AMP concentration intracellularly is as a function of time, then what we would expect is when calcium goes up, uh, it's going to activate this adenylylcyclase 8 enzyme, which is in the uh, sperm. That's going to make more cyclic AMP, so we would expect cyclic AMP to oscillate uh, in phase with the calcium. So we'd expect to have a phasic oscillation of cyclic AMP, basically, like so. Okay, and that is indeed what we see. When we actually do the experiment and look at the cyclic AMP concentration, we see that cyclic AMP does oscillate in phase with the oscillations in calcium. So when calcium goes up, cyclic AMP also goes up. Okay, brilliant. Now, what we do is we do this experiment again where we put in very high, constantly very high calcium levels. We know that we get no movement, and then we see what happens to the cyclic AMP level, and we find that cyclic AMP remains low. So if you just have continuously high calcium levels, um, then that doesn't stimulate the adenylylcyclase 8 enzyme. The adenylylcyclase 8 enzyme wants the oscillations in calcium in order to actually be activated, basically. And if you don't have oscillations in calcium, if you just have a constantly high calcium level, then uh, the cyclic AMP level remains low. Okay, so let's explore this more. Why? Why do you need oscillating levels of uh, calcium in order to actually activate the adenylylcyclase 8? And I should, I should say, what will happen is, if, if I just suddenly raised calcium levels from, say, zero to some high level and then maintain them high, then the instant you rise it, raise it. So let me show you another graph. In fact, let me draw this. So if I had time, and then I had calcium concentration intracellularly. Okay, uh, and then I went from zero calcium, suddenly jumped up to a high level, and then kept it high. What would happen in cy with cyclic AMP if, is if I plotted the concentration of cyclic AMP uh, intracellularly, what I would see is initially it would be low, and then the instant the calcium jumps up, what I would see is a spike in cyclic AMP, which would then go down. So basically, it looks as though adenylylcyclase responds to a change in calcium level rather than to just high calcium levels. So it just, it's, it's responding to a change, a derivative, rather than the absolute amount, basically. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.